Hi, I'm Marty, and welcome to the Stimmen 30 Mission Debrief on our latest episode, Top of the Tower, all about air traffic control. Today we are joined by Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum Deputy Director Chris Brown. Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. My pleasure. So for those of you watching on Facebook, if you've got a question, go down to the comments section, put it in there. If you're watching on another platform, either head over to Facebook or send it to us via um, email, stimmen30 at si.edu or on Twitter. Send a carrier pigeon if you need to. Get those questions here and we'll get them answered. But I have a challenge for you watching. I want you, try, I want you to try to stump our deputy director. <laughs> oh, no. Be nice. Now, Chris, you've got a long history in aviation. Kind of walk us through some of the steps that you've had before you got here to air and space. Well, I uh, uh, got my private license while I was in college up in uh, West Lebanon, New Hampshire, and uh, it was a small Cessna 150, two-seater, and it was actually a tower-controlled airport, but it wasn't too busy, so it was a great environment to learn to fly in. And that uh, convinced me I wanted to go into some kind of aviation career, so I joined the Navy upon graduation in 1980 and flew F-14s for seven years of active service and then in the reserves. And then after that, uh, took a little bit of a hiatus from actually being in the cockpit professionally and uh, managed airports for 30 years, Reagan National and Dallas airports. I continued to fly privately. And then um, I was fortunate enough to be able to join the team here at Air and Space. And I say it's kind of nice because the planes don't move and everybody's happy. However, the, I, I have heard that there is a, an airplane that you have a special connection to at our, at our Stephen F. Udvar Hazy Center. Indeed, it's the uh, F-14. Uh, the aircraft uh, was retired back in, I think it was 2006 or thereabouts. Uh, great aircraft. I had the occasion to fly the actual airframe that is now at Udvar Hazy. I don't know if I should now feel much older as a result of it, <laughs> that it's in a museum, but I guess I'm in a museum too. So, How tempting is it to just, you know, see if we can roll it out to the right? Uh, very tempting. It's right near the door. So we <laughs> open the door and kick the tires and light the fires, as we say. Awesome. So we're talking about air traffic control and, and keeping people safe when they fly. Um, tell us a little bit. You were in charge of a couple of different airports. Mm -hmm. Tell us how important those air traffic controllers are to the operation of that airport. Uh, essential. Uh, they essentially own the airspace, if you will, and the airport operators sort of own the surface. And um, to the extent that the airspace isn't properly managed or open, for that matter, then nothing, nothing happens. And so they're absolutely critical to the functioning, safe functioning of, of flight activity. Clearly not every airport has a control tower. Some airspace is much less congested than others. But at, uh, at the large airports where you do see towers, the air traffic controllers are key in terms of maintaining uh, not just very safe standards, but uh, separation, efficiencies, uh, and just the overall conduct of the flight activity. They're not the only ones at an airport helping keep people safe, are they? No, no. I mean, there's a host of people. As I mentioned, I, uh, uh, in my role as the airport manager, uh, we would manage essentially the ground, if you will, the terminals and so forth, but with respect to the runways, uh, when it snows, it's the airport operator and those teams that have to clear the snow and make sure that the runway surface is safe and usable for the aircraft. And so the airport operators work very closely with air traffic controllers to make sure that uh, the controllers aren't bringing in airplanes to land if the runways are closed and um, that the airport operators are prepared and ready for that flight activity. So we worked very, very closely and continue to at airports across the country. If you're watching, don't forget, you can submit questions, go down to the comments section, send them all in. We want to get to as many as we can. Chris, you were at Reagan National Airport on 9-11. Correct. Tell us about that day. Um, well, you know, it's a, quite a, everybody has a story of sort of where they were at that time. Um, we, uh, our cameras on the airfield actually witnessed the, and filmed the uh, American Flight 77 that had taken off from Dallas that uh, impacted and crashed into the Pentagon. Our fire uh, equipment were the first ones to respond to the Pentagon. Uh, we sent our director of operations over to the Pentagon and I was uh, in charge of the airport and we were really uh, trying to understand, like the rest of the world, what was happening, but it was very clear that we were going to be closing the airspace, and uh, that was a huge task for um, our controller uh, uh, colleagues at FAA. 
And I think one of the real lessons out of 9-11, sad as it may be, but it was an amazing Herculean effort by the FAA controllers. I think it's one of the mo more amazing stories uh, to have come out of, of that whole um, uh, horrible period as it was, is to be able to literally take down the entire air traffic control system and do it safely. I mean, it was really remarkable. So as the airport manager at Reagan at the time, I had a direct contact, open line, with our um, air traffic controllers at uh, Reagan, but also the FBI uh, Command and Control Center downtown, because we were, uh, we were actually tracking ourselves at the airport, uh, the flight that, uh, the United flight that went into Shanksville, because wow. we knew it was coming into the city. We did not know at that time where it was going to impact. We were trying to prepare the airport for the possibility that would impact the airport. Airports tend to be big things that you see from, from uh, uh, the sky, and and we have a you know large uh, fuel tanks and so forth. So um, we were evacuating the airport, um, much like everyone else was. So John, watching online, wants to know um, who actually made that decision to close the airspace. Well, I, I think it's. Um, Probably a story best told by uh, folks at the FAA. Um, clearly, the Secretary of Transportation, Norm Mineta, uh, was part of that decision. I think the White House would say it. But I think uh, there were folks in the Air Traffic Control and Command Center that were likely a step ahead in moving in that direction. I mean, I think one of the things about 9-11, from my experience, a lot of people started responding, and the professionals, um, as their training dictated and we're making decisions as we would want. Um, frankly, I didn't need to evacuate the airport. People were self-evacuating mm -hmm. and if businesses were closing down, people didn't really need to be told too much in that regard. And I, my understanding is, is that there were uh, folks at the FAA's Command and Control Center that were uh, very much moving in that direction almost at the same moment and senior leadership was making the decisions here in the city. Seems like an amazing piece of coordination. That was remarkable. With everyone. Absolutely. What was the airport like the week after that? Well, it was at the moment of, we actually had burning embers from the uh, smoke plume of the Pentagon landing on the airport. Um, and in the hours, minutes, and hours to follow, it was almost like a science fiction movie. Everybody had evacuated, uh, many employees, but certainly the public. And to the point we had rental cars being returned that still were running, but nobody there. We had shops, um, uh, food and beverages stores in the, in the uh, airport with ovens on, nobody there. It was as if all the people had been taken out. And at Reagan, we, unlike the other airports around the country, did not reopen uh, sh within several days. We remained closed out of concerns of its proximity to the national capital. And it was three and a half weeks of sort of this uncertainty of not knowing whether we were going to reopen or have to close permanently the airport. And so it was sort of betwixt and between. One of the things I, I share is that we actually had to put locks on our front doors. An airport like uh, Reagan is, is open 24-7 and as such has, is, is co we, we never lock the doors. We had to figure out, well, now we have to sort of lock down the place. And so we physically installed locks where they'd never been. Wow. Don't forget, if you have a question, go down to the comments section, send it on email, send it on Twitter. Uh, we want to know what questions you have. Um, so, Chris, how did you get interested in flying? You said you started in, high, or in college. Well, it actually started even uh, earlier than that. Um, not much older, I would say, than much of the audience, I suspect, uh, listening to the show. The, um, I always had a fascination with it, but my father had a good friend who flew a float plane, and the two of them used to take these, uh, disappear for two weeks in the summer into the Canadian Arctic, and this was flying that nobody was doing at that time, and and they were fishermen. They loved to go fish, and so he would, they would come back with beards and and tales of traveling to the end of the earth, literally, and um, so I really got bitten by it and um, had the occasion in high school to, to join them on several of their trips and said, this is something I want to do. Cool. Jill wants to know, what kind of planes have you flown and what was your favorite? Um, 
Cessna 11439 or was the 150 that I learned in. It's a great airplane. Um, uh, clearly, my bias is the F-14. Uh, it, it's just a. It was sometimes you actually have to pinch yourself to remind that you know you're actually uh, entrusted with this amazing airplane to fly on behalf of the the country. Uh, great airplane. Uh, but you know, I, I love small airplanes too. Some people have said, well, after you got out of the F-14, didn't everything else just pale by comparison? It's all different. You know, I love float planes. And uh, my dream would be to get a Cessna 185 on amphibious floats and haven't figured out how to do that, but maybe one day. <laughs> nice. All right, um, William Edney wants to know, um, how is air traffic control going to change as we, as we move into the future? It's a great question. I'd say it's already changing. You know, the as the show illustrated, uh, much of the system heretofore has been based on air traffic control, based on ground radar, radar stations located on the ground that provide uh, situational awareness to the controllers and to the uh, air crews. That's changing with uh, the upgrade of the system, where it's now much more satellite-based navigation. Not that radars are obsolete or no longer used. But more and more, the actual um, satellite uh, uh, systems in place, GPS and otherwise, provide the level of um, uh, clarity and exactness, if you will, to permit controllers and air crew to begin to um, uh, provide separation standards and safe flight using uh, satellite-based navigation. It also provides uh, air crew a lot more situational awareness of where other aircraft are to the point that um, in many cases air controllers are not uh, having to uh, actually audibly advise uh, an aircraft of, a, of another approaching aircraft. It's all uh, presented in the cockpit directly to, to the pilots through satellite-based navigation. One of the things that surprised me as we were working on the show that came out last week, Air Traffic Control, if you haven't watched it yet, go watch it, was that um, we got a chance to go into the, the tower at Manassas Airport, which is a very small airport, and, and I got to go up in there and they were passing these cards back and forth, mm -hmm. these strips of paper sure. to keep track of the airplanes. And I thought, okay, that's got to be because Manassas is a small airport and, and everything. And then as I watched uh, an edit of the episode, some of my colleagues had gone to Dulles Tower and they were using the same strips. Tell us about the strips and why do we still use those? Yeah, I mean, I, I should preface by saying I'm not an air traffic controller, but as certainly as I understand it, um, when this, some of the systems were being designed, the strips were viewed by the designers as being arcane and, no, and obsolete. And I think it was the controllers themselves who said as part of the design process, no, no, we want that capability. It provides backup, but it's also, um, it, it gives situational awareness as well to people that are used to um, uh, seeing things visually, I would say. I'm reminded, frankly, of the Mercury uh, space program. You know, the single piloted uh, Mercury capsule was originally designed by the engineers to not have a window. And the early astronauts said, there's no way we're going to fly this thing unless there's a window. <laughs> and the engineers said, well, you don't need a window. And they said, we're not flying it without a window. And so I think um, sometimes the things that seem so simple and unnecessary are, in fact, quite necessary. So if, if I were a controller, as I know how the strip's being used, I would want them as well. It's, it's a backup. It's just it's something that uh, provides them that added level of uh, clarity and, and, and safety. How does that compare to the Ouija board on an aircraft carrier? Nah. So, so if you don't know this, on an aircraft carrier, and, and you should explain this more than I can, but it's, a, it's basically a big cutout of the carrier, yeah. and they use... A scale little, cutout. Scale yeah. cutouts to move the planes around. Yeah, the, the carrier is several decks, as you know, and you've got a hangar deck below, and then you've got a, the flight deck full of airplanes, and invariably they're trying to get the airplane from the flight deck down to get maintained in the hangar deck and vice versa. And there's uh, the, the, the aircraft have to physically be moved around the deck of the carrier in a way that uh, uh, obviously maintains safe standards and so forth, but also efficiency. You know, the key thing with the carrier is the ability to land and launch aircraft quickly and efficiently. And sort of to do that both at rehearsal but also real time, uh, the aircraft handler has just this a large plexi cutout of the flight deck with uh, scale models of the aircraft. 
so that he or she can actually position and reposition these models <laughs> to determine before we start towing and moving aircraft around the flight deck, can they actually fit and fit and it's kind of like a puzzle. It looks very arcane by, by uh, modern standards, but think of streetlights today. They haven't changed or evolved in decades, and I don't think they will. They're arcane, but they work, and they work really well. So I don't know of any engineer out there who says, we got something better than the stoplight, let's get rid of them. And so I, I suspect the Ouija board will be around on carriers of the future. Awesome. All right, so Mrs. Carroll's class is watching. Hi, Mrs. Carroll's class. Thanks for tuning in. They want to know, um, were you scared during 9-11? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, um, I think for many of us involved in the industry, we kind of uh, fell into sort of our, you know, the professional mode of responding. I remember being in our operations center and dealing with issues at the airport, which in my in my world at that time were profound, and looking at the TV screen and watching the tower collapse. And it certainly registered as to what was happening, but I knew that I had to stay focused on what was more immediately within my control and something I had to respond to. And it wasn't really until hours later when things, when my world started to get a little bit less crazy uh, that I could reflect back on the magnitude of what was happening. And I think that was probably true for a lot of people, controllers and others you deal professionally, you focus on the moment and, and what is most pressing and telling. I think that's a, a, a natural and good reaction. And, and whether it was fear or emotional response to it, I would say it didn't really kick in until much later. Uh, one of the times I was uh, scared in a flight is ha almost had a, came as close to a midair in F-14s as you could possibly get. And it wasn't until I was on the ground and debriefing that it really sunk in as to, because at that moment you're flying, you're avoiding, you're spawning, you're landing the aircraft and, and you, you recover. And there was just a delay. So I suspect that was true for a lot of people on that day. Uh, and, and students that are watching that maybe weren't born yet, you know, on 9-11, this is a great opportunity for you to go talk to somebody that was there that day um, and that remembers that, you know, I was standing in front of a class full of fifth graders the uh, girl came in and said, Mr. Kelsey, did you hear about a, a plane that hit the World Trade Center? And I had no idea what was going on. I'd been in a meeting all morning and didn't know anything. Um, and so it's a very vivid um, experience that kind of this collective experience that everybody has. And so students that weren't around for that, that look at this as history, go talk to somebody that was there and talk to them about what their feelings were and when they heard, because everybody has a story. And it can be a really personal way to learn about this. So we encourage you to definitely um, go do that. We've got another question here from Stan. He wants to know, um, will airspace reach a point where it's too busy? Um, I'm sure that it, it'll get, as it has in some areas where they have to meter traffic, where they actually reduce the volume coming into an airport or into certain airspace. But one of the advantages of the technologies now being rolled out that we talked about satellite based is that they're able to uh, provide closer separation between aircraft at, at extremely safe, in a very, very safe way. So they're, it's almost like they're able to use the highways and the roadways more efficiently, not by just creating gridlock, but by flowing uh, in a sequenced way that allows for more volume. But clearly there, I mean, Heathrow Airport is a great example. There's only so much you can do. Um, and there's only so much runway pavement, and, and in certain areas, yeah, I mean, it, it becomes congested and, and, and the opportunities for growth is limited. One of the things that, that I learned while working on this show is that air traffic controllers think of the runways as extending beyond the pavement. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was an interesting idea. It, as a, as a, a you pilot, mean the approach? The, the approach, approach yeah, coming, coming in, in and, yeah. and everything. Yeah. Do you think that same way as a pilot? Yeah, I mean, I think they're sort of invisible highways of the sky. I mean, uh, it may not seem it sometimes when you're flying, but, but in most cases, certainly on commercial flights, they're on a very prescribed route routing system. And, and if you pull out some of the, the charts and, uh, that, the avia, that the flight crews use, you will see they look kind of like road maps with much more direct lines, if you will, mm -hmm. called uh, you know, flight quarters and airways. And the controllers, in some cases, will have, have uh, flights deviate off of those uh, virtual highways to avoid weather and the like. 
But um, it isn't just a chaotic mess going on. It's actually very well choreographed, and um, it's, it's very impressive. Now, um, working at, at airports, there are other things that you all have done to help people feel safe beyond just the safety in the, in the actual airplane, like landscaping and some of the, mm -hmm. those features. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things as an airport operator we want to do is remind ourselves uh, in that world I was in that the journey begins not when somebody's actually seated in the aircraft, but as they come onto the airport. And so you want to certainly convey a sense of professionalism, a sense of investment, of caring. I always said that, you know, if you can't cut the grass or change the light bulbs or paint the aircraft, that is symbolic or a sign of perhaps a deeper-seated lack of commitment that may be in play. So I won't get on an airplane that's peeling paint and looks like it should not be flying. I won't do it because it makes me wonder, like, all right, where's the investment on those things that you can't see? And it's funny you mentioned landscaping. Um, it, uh, is cutting the grass going to make your flight safer? Not necessarily, but I think if you see that the commitment by the airport operator in this case is to take care of this facility, to ensure that this facility is operating, then you might assume that the escalator you're about to get on is being well maintained, or those jet bridges are the things that make your journey safe or potentially hazardous. And so it's a, it's a matter of being professional. I feel like that has a great connection to classrooms. You know, when I was teaching, we'd talk about sign your name and the, on the paper, you know, those Absolutely. little things that make such a big difference. And it sounds like that's exactly what you're talking about. Exactly. It's those little things that show kind of that overall package of safety in an airport or, or quality of work when you're a student. Sure. I mean, you, the, it shows that you're investing in, in whether it's your student or you're investing in the customer or that person getting on your aircraft. How important is training for all of the different steps along the road, the air traffic controllers, the pilots, the, you know, all of the support crew that go into that. How important is the training element? Uh, I would say it's absolutely critical. In the military, it may sound crass, but we always said you only fight as well as you train. And I can say that in the course of my professional career, having managed many, many, many budgets, I've never cut a training budget. I've cut other budgets, but never cut a training budget because you, we can't expect high performance, whether it's a controller or, or a teacher or whoever it may be, we can't expect high standards if we're not willing to invest in the training that gives them recurrency, but also advanced training. I mean, in the case of controllers, you know, the, the technologies are changing, the volume of use of our airspace is changing, their world changes, and if they're not trained to keep pace with that, then um, at the very least there's operational inefficiency that occurs and potentially safety. So, um, you know, training is, is fundamental. It, it, you can't expect to perform better than what your training provides you. On an aircraft carrier when it's not deployed, and, and, and I don't know because I've not been on one when it's deployed, but it seems like it's training, 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 Absolutely. training. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's, you never stop. Every, every flight is a training evolution. It may have a real-world purpose, but it's also a training evolution. Wow. Now, what's the learning curve on learning to fly an, an F-14 versus a Cessna? Like, is, once you know how to fly a Cessna, are you, you know, a short learning curve to fly a jet, or is that a pretty steep curve even if it, you know how to fly? I, I would say it's a pretty steep curve even if you know how to fly. I'll say one thing that the services do very well is they don't assume that, that somebody coming in knows, has the skills to, to whether it's to maintain the aircraft or to fly the aircraft, and they train. They, in many cases, it certainly is true in the pilot community, they train quickly and they bring a lot on. So. Uh, you got to keep pace. You got to do your homework <laughs> because I actually would there there would be cases where somebody that came in with flying experience in the initial period would say, "Well, Max, relax. I don't have to do this because I've been there." And they might get by for the first little part of, it, but then they won't have had and practiced the things mm -hmm. needed to advance to the next level. And we actually had a guy in our flight class. He came in with 1,200 hours of previous experience. He almost washed out because 
he had assumed too much in terms of what he knew. Now, you mentioned homework. Are you telling me that when you learn to fly an F-14, you've got homework? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, and, and again, I, I don't sit here as any, any incredibly bright person. The wonderful thing that the military does is provide you what you need. If you've got the, the uh, desire, the, the discipline, and the aptitude, you know, the, the, as we say, the sky's the limit. But uh, absolutely. Uh, incredible amount of homework. I went through Top Gun and a lot of people see the movie and, and see that part but every flight we took there was three hours of preparation and then at least three hours of, of post uh, debrief. So the flying is great but um, whether it's preparing for the flight training or the people that got to maintain the aircraft and get it ready there's a whole lot that uh, has to be done as homework if you will. Do they really use the airplanes on the stick? Oh, yeah. <laughs> or your hands, too, you know? Yeah. That's awesome. Awesome. Um, so in our, in our episode, we talk with Ginger Z, and she talks mm -hmm. about personal accountability when you're, when you're traveling, predominantly right. about the weather. What's your view on that? Like, how, how invested should I be in my flight when I'm going to see my grandma? Well, I think uh, one of the things I would say is uh, if you have the option of traveling earlier in the day, I would do so. I don't think Ginger mentioned that. But um, you're less likely to have the impacts from weather or congestion earlier in the day. And if you're on a, excuse me, a connecting flight, <coughs> pardon me, you may want to try to connect through those, commu those airports that are less busy. There are certain things you can do to reduce the chance of a delay um, that might occur because the system is just so heavily uh, used. Um, uh, you know, I try to avoid Chicago as a connecting airport in the winter. I try to avoid Dallas as a connecting airport in the in the summer because of thunderstorms. Now, my <laughs> colleagues at those airports will probably be upset with me. But I mean, I think there's things you can do if you have the flexibility. Sure. Um, so we're just about out of time. We've got a couple of minutes left. If you've got a question, go ahead and put it in there real quick. Um, if you haven't checked out the episode, it's called Top of the Tower, How Air Traffic Control Helps Keep Us Safe. We encourage you to go check that out. Um, Chris, any last words for us about, you know, flying in general and, and a student that maybe wants to get into aviation? I, you know, I, I think part of it is uh, if you have the chance to take a flight or even swing by your local airport, um, and have that opportunity to make some kind of a connection, I, I would urge you to do so. I mean, it has been a tremendous uh, opportunity for me, both professionally and personally. Um, and I would say that the, the industry is growing. We need pilots. Uh, there's forecast pilot shortage. We need maintainers. We need engineers. Um, it's, a, it's a great line of work to be in. Um, and it really carries a somewhat sacred duty. I mean, whether you're designing or maintaining the aircraft or flying it, you know, others are relying on you for their personal safety and conveyance. And uh, it, it it's brings great meaning to, to those of us in the industry. It's not, we're just not making widgets, we're doing things that actually speak to a human need uh, to travel, which will continue to be a need, and to do so safely and efficiently. Awesome. Well, Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. We hope everybody tunes in next month. We'll be talking about women in aerospace. That episode comes out on October 3rd. And we have a very special guest, Anusha Ansari, who is the first private space explorer who will be on that show. We hope you tune in then. Thanks for watching. Thank you.